I'm Nabil Ahmed and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Attorneys General in eight eastern seaboard states are suing the EPA over air pollution blowing in from upwind states. New York's Eric Schneiderman, the leading Attorney General in the lawsuit, says it was filed today in the Federal Appeals Court to force the Trump administration to take action to ensure upwind states control pollution. Three U.S. cities filed a federal lawsuit against the Defense Department, saying service members disqualified from gun ownership weren't reported to the FBI. New York, San Francisco and Philadelphia argue the DOJ failed to report significant numbers of disqualifying records to the Bureau's national background check system for gun licensing and sales. Homeowners in states with the highest property taxes are looking to prepay 2018 bills ahead of a $10,000 cap on the deduction for property taxes. The new rules come with the GOP tax overhaul President Trump signed last week. Tens of thousands of Puerto Rico residents remain without power more than three months after Hurricane Maria destroyed the U.S. island's electrical grid. A study conducted this month by local engineers estimated roughly 50% of the island's 3.3 million people remained without power. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nabila Ahmed. This is Bloomberg. I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Well, coming up, Apple shares take a hit after some reports of lackluster demand for the iPhone 10. Can the tech giant prove the analysts wrong? We shall see. Plus, Amazon Alexa celebrates a very strong holiday season. We're going to look at how the smart home tech gadget fits into Amazon's plans for 2018. And Bitcoin, what a ride. It's cryptocurrency rallying past 16,000 after last week's big sell-off. What does this mean about the Bitcoin bubble? But first, to our lead, Apple analysts, a number of them lowering iPhone 10 shipment projections for the first quarter, citing weak demand at the end of the holiday season. Shares falling 2.7%, 2.5% on the day. Uh, Sinolink Securities was one of them. They said 10 million fewer units will be sold in Q1 2018 compared to the current quarter. Jail Warren Capital sees shipments down 5 million, blaming the phone's high price and a lack of interesting innovations. Joining us right now, Bloomberg Tech's uh, Alex Webb, who covers Apple for us. Um, Alex, we talked about this on Bloomberg Radio just a little while ago. Um, and, and this is really interesting because it, it's, it's both a projection of what's gonna, about to happen in the quarter that starts next week and what just happened in the holiday season. It had been one of the concerns heading into the Christmas quarter. Of course, the uh, iPhone 10 was re released six weeks after the iPhone 8. And so there was an, uh, a fear that maybe if they got too close to the release date for the Samsung, the ne next high-end smartphone, which is probably going to come in March, if they get too close to that, then there's not going to be enough demand to sustain the numbers that they would otherwise hope to get. So competition is another part of this. Exactly, yes. And I, I think, you know, particularly in China, we've seen that a lot of the local manufacturers are coming out with products now which are, you know, far lower price point than what Apple is able to offer but also very similar features. Now, of course, no one quite yet has the um, Face ID, the 3D sensor, which the iPhone has, but as some of these anal analysts, analysts were writing earlier today, that's perhaps not been enough to, to um, gin up demand for the product. It seems to be the, a big part of Apple's strategy at, with this phone release, both these phones, is really um, uh, ginning up, if you will, a marketplace uh, of potentially new applications and stuff that we haven't really seen yet. So the phone does some really cool facial recognition stuff, or could, but there aren't a lot of applications for that. The phone has a lot of uh, interesting features, haptic features and other things that the earlier phones didn't have, but there's no real uses for it yet. I mean, it, it's the kind of curse of being Apple that, of course, they're very secretive about what they've got in the pipeline in terms of hardware. Now, when they released the phone or unveiled the phone in September ahead of its release in November, that's not a huge time frame for analysts, sorry, for developers to start coming right. up with, with new tools which you can download in the App Store. It might be that over the course of the next year or 18 months, we see far more compelling innovation which use these 3D sensors. I think one of the things some of these analysts aren't really taking into account, though, is that the that we'll never know the mix between iPhone 8s and iPhone 10s, but that if they sell a lot more iPhone 10s, both the top line and the bottom line, because the phone's so expensive, are going to do so well. And there's always this chatter saying, oh, China's not going to buy the expensive phone, India's not going to buy the expensive phone. What we've seen is quite the opposite, that China loves the big expensive phone and are willing to pay up for that luxury uh, item. I think the other element you've got to think about is that the iPhone 8 is largely the same form factor, shape, design, 
as the iPhone 6, you know, there's not a huge amount of change between those three generations of phones, 6, 6S, 7, and 8. That means, of course, the bill of material has come right the way down for the iPhone 8, but the price point is still pretty high. So it's not the end of the world of Apple selling iPhone 8s rather than iPhone 10s because the, the sort of four, three or four years they've had of the phone have meant that the components are very cheap for them. And so cross, cross margins might be better on the 8 then? Well, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to tell right. that. There are some estimates out there. It's not necessarily they'll be better, but they're not perhaps significantly worse, I think, than on the 10. And to be clear, the estimates, even though some of the numbers have come down, they're still predicting the biggest first quarter Apple's ever had. They're still predicting 10% year-over-year revenue growth growth on one of the biggest, most profitable companies in the world. Absolutely. And don't forget, of course, Apple itself, as you said, doesn't break out any iPhone um, revenue numbers. And so what we're going to be seeing or is... Or specific iPhones. We'll know iPhones, but we won't know specifically exactly, which yes, phones. Exactly, yes, which phones they are. And so um, that means that, of course, then the uh, the uh, forecast for the revenue forecast for the right. quarter that Apple has made itself, that might already take into account some of this slackening demand. And we'll never know about the HomePod. Well, I mean, the thing is that even if the HomePod had been out for yes. this Christmas, I think we saw estimates that they were going to ship 50,000 units. For Apple, 50,000 units at $300 a pop is not a huge amount of money. As we say in the States, big whoop. Uh, I, I, I'm glad that you say it. I certainly would not use that phrase if I could. Alex Webb, thank you very much for your uh, discretion. All right. Well, coming up, looking about Apple's big year, the iPhone became the first uh, maker, or the first U.S. company to have a $900 billion market cap back in November. And now in June, they un unveiled, as I mentioned, the HomePod. Began shipping in the U.S., U.K., and Australia in early 2018 or so, they say. We shall see. But Bloomberg's Emily Chang sat down with CEO Tim Cook at this year's annual developers conference and asked him about his vision for the company's future product line. Started by asking about the HomePod and how tough that is in an already crowded market. You know, what we've tried to do is build something that is a breakthrough speaker first. And so uh, music is deep in our DNA, you know, dating back from iTunes and, and iPod. And so we wanted something that, number one, sounded unbelievable. And uh, I think when people listen to it, they're going to be shocked over the quality of the sound. And, and of course, it does a lot of other things, right? And, and all those are important as well. Uh, but, but we wanted a really high quality audio experience as well. You're very focused on how this could reinvent music in the home. Yeah. What about these other things? Will I be able to make a phone call, call a car, order groceries? There's a lot of things you can do with it. Uh, you know, one of the advantages that we have is that uh, there's a lot of things that, that Siri knows how to do from the, from the phone. And so uh, we'll start with a, a patch of those, as, as uh, Phil showed today during the keynote. And then you can bet that there's a nice, nice follow-on activity there as well. So let's talk about e-commerce. E-commerce is very yeah. important to these devices. I can order paper towels on my Amazon Echo. Does this tell us something about Apple's aspirations in retail? No, I wouldn't read anything to it in uh, that regard. I, wh what I would read into it is uh, Apple's a company that deeply cares about music and wants to deliver a great audio experience in the home. We feel like we reinvented it at, in the portable player area, and we think we can reinvent it in the home as well. And we know that people want a speaker now to do more than that, and, and obviously we want a speaker to do more than that, and, and so we're sort of combining what has been thought of to be two distinctly different things till now. And I think people are going to love it. I know they are. I mean, I mean I'm a user, and uh, I think they're going to be kind of blown away with, with the experience. How long have you been working on this? Uh, multiple years. Multiple years. And so if you, the underlying technology in here is uh, uh, something to behold. And uh, to get the experience that we wanted at the quality we wanted, you know, like, like Apple products in, in general take multiple years to do, starting from the core technology and then building up to the product. You have people out there saying, finally, what took so long? You, you know, uh, for, for us, it's never been about being first to anything. If you think back, uh, we didn't have the first MP3 player. 
we didn't have the first smartphone. We didn't have the first tablet. There was a tablet shipping a decade before. Very few people used it. Uh, arguably, we shipped the first modern MP3 player, the first modern smartphone, the first modern tablet, but we weren't first in any of those. And so for us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best mm -hmm. and uh, giving the user an experience that delights them every time. And, and so I, we don't get, we don't let that impatience uh, result in shipping something that's just, just not great, right? It's the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. You've unveiled the new iOS, iOS 11. What does that tell us about what's next? With well, I wouldn't want to answer that, but I, I can tell you that iOS 11 is unbelievable. Uh, and both for iPhone and for iPad. I mean, there's incredible things in it from peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments, uh, I, it's the biggest iPad release ever, and an area that I have uh, great personal excitement, I, I'm excited about all of it, but I'm incredibly excited about AR. And uh, you saw the demos that were done today. Uh, I think this is profound. And uh, I think we today are, as we get this developer release out in the hands of the developers, uh, we'll have the largest augmented reality platform in the world. And uh, I think we have launched AR in, in a way to, to large numbers of people. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to see what some of the developers are kind of come up with with AR kit. Exactly. You talked a lot about AR and VR with regards to developers, but what about consumers? When will consumers see an Apple AR product? <laughs> well, that's another one of those things I'm obviously not going to answer. Uh, but, but, you know, with a core technology, uh, and as a platform owner, the, the first thing, and uh, arguably in some ways the most important, is to build the foundation. And then from that foundation, you can do many things off of it, but first you have to have a really solid foundation. And so uh, I think the developers are really going to love what they find in the, in the developer build on ARKit. Bloomberg is Emily Chang with Apple CEO Tim Cook. Well, finding a rocky year at Uber ends now. The Wall Street Journal is saying the company has agreed to sell its U.S. prime auto leasing business, uh, Exchange, uh, leasing the startup car marketplace, Fair.com. But you see that the move demonstrates CEO Derek Khosrow Shahi's focus on cost cutting at Uber. Financial terms are not disclosed. Well, coming up, Amazon could be a big holiday winner again, announcing 4 million people, people giving a trial of Amazon Prime in just one week. We're going to take an in-depth look at the king of e-commerce. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 o'clock back east, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Amazon, once again, could be the big winner this holiday season. The tech titan says ten, tens of millions, I should say, of, of Alexa-enabled devices were sold worldwide, many to me. Amazon dot sitting in the top selling spot across all categories on the site. Amazon also said four million people started prime trials, free trials, and maybe begin uh, paid memberships as well, all in just one week over the holidays. Joining us right now, Mark Mahaney of RBC, a capital markets uh, analyst. I'm not kidding. I, I, I thought I was going to buy one or two of these Echo Dots. I think I gave away six over the holidays, seven. There was also a Sonos device in there with Alexa in it. Uh, this seemed like it was a go-to gift. Uh, well, that bodes well for these guys. It should. So they say that their top two selling items, or one was an Echo and the other one was a Fire Stick. That was Alexa enabled. So there's a couple of wins here for the company. One, to get more of these devices out. But secondly, that the tangential here is how many more uh, Alexa enabled devices there are. You can actually go on Amazon and search for Alexa enabled devices. Right. And you'll find your Sonos speakers. You'll find your light bulbs. I mean, there's going to be an increasing number of things. So they get the ecosystem out there is a big win. They also put in a press release that they saw um, uh, millions of prime customers were using Alexa to order products on Amazon. So not only are they selling you a device, but they're also selling you kind of a convenience. So it'll be easier to turn around in the kitchen and say, Alexa, order more coffee. Obviously, uh, apparently, uh, well, more yeah. Amazon customers are doing that. And I think that that's, I, I think that's, I think that's why they open up the platform. I mean, this Sonos device, yes. I got the app model of the Sonos device. It was like 450 bucks, so not, not for nothing. I hope she's not watching right now. But, but, uh, uh, but, but a really fantastic device, terrific sound, but it's not made by Amazon. Why would Amazon give that away? 
Well, you get the uh, Amazon ecosystem embedded in multiple devices, and Amazon just has more ways to offer you products and deliver products to you. I'm sorry, so you can order, you can interact with Amazon, not just when you're in here, in your desktop, with your phone, but maybe when you're driving, and you can talk to your car and order from Alexa. I saw Garmin offering one of those things, uh, an Alexa-enabled device for your car. So it's going to be a win. Right now, we think, and we're probably too conservative given the numbers they talked about in the press release this morning, right. we thought there were about 40 million Amazon and uh, Alexa Echo installed devices. That number's probably 50, could be even 60 million, and it's growing really? rapidly. There are a couple of other things, Corey, by the way, I thought were really interesting in press release this morning. You already mentioned the other one, the number of Prime customers. We think there's 60 million in the U.S. They added four in just one week. You know, are there subscriptions? Oh, trials, well, subscriptions. what's the conversion we'll rate there, do you think? Over some of the tries, particularly on the holidays, it's probably lower than it is other times. Yeah, but you know, but given fifty percent, something like that, it's probably higher. And then there was another one: um, the number of units that they uh, delivered um, uh, expedited, either right. uh, Prime or same day or next day, doubled year over year. People talk about this price. And this on a revenue uh, run rate of about, or revenue growth run rate of about twenty-five. Yeah, yeah, but the point is there's there's more than just um, a price advantage and a selection advantage that Amazon has. Probably the biggest moat that they're building around the, the company is their ability to get you products faster than anybody else. It matters. It matters as, you, as you're going into uh, Christmas and you don't have those gifts ready to go. You can still order on the 23rd or the 24th, and then you recognize that uh, that advantage, and you'll use that when you shop through with Amazon throughout the year. That convenience advantage is really widening. That's the new moat at uh, Amazon. Our producer, Jackie Lopez, just bailing me out, showing us about 31 percent predicted growth on a year over year basis. <laughs> that of course includes a lot of very fast growth in Amazon Web Services. Um, but it, it's intriguing to me too that uh, the, all the different businesses we see these guys going into, do they all still go back looking at sort of B2C, selling stuff to people, selling physical goods to people that they might get into electronics, they might get into video, they might get into uh, whatever. Um, even even uh, uh, special uh, drugs, whatever, but really it's just about selling volume of goods to consumers. I think so. Uh, it's just building out the customer relationship, and one of the strongest relationships we as um, consumers have is with the people that you know we send, uh, give our money to, and you know, in response we get uh, right. in response to um, in order to get products. That's a very strong retail relationship. You can have a media relationship, but very few com very few companies have that tight of a media relationship. Maybe a Netflix, maybe a Google, and a Facebook. Book. Throw but Disney a, in there, but yes, but a re and Disney and multiple brands, right? But a retail relationship and Amazon now they're they're providing you goods and uh, some services, entertainment, um, and anything just uh, convenience. You can find products around the house, and yes, they're absolutely breaking into new categories. You know that expanding into groceries, the, si the single largest consumer product category. Right. They they're now the largest uh, vendor of apparel in this country. So there are there are still Drugs. green field opportunities for them. I think it's al almost inevitable that they go there. I think that's still three to five years out, but in inevitable. Um, I, I just wonder if they, they are really going to get brand. I think what's interesting about Alexis is that they're really getting brand a little bit, uh, which they've never really done. And Amazon seems to have a, a philosophical belief that people always migrate towards the cheapest thing. Brand is, is of course, the opposite of that. Uh, it creates the opportunity for Amazon private label, but also creates another revenue opportunity that's in nobody's numbers. So uh, Apple, the App Store, they take a 30% tax on all products right. bought and sold on that uh, in the Apple Store. Google Home does the same thing. Right now, Amazon doesn't get any of that tax revenue, but you, you get 100 million, 200 million Alexa devices and Alexa-enabled devices out there, and all of a sudden, when that consumer says, I need more coffee, or I need diapers, or I need a car service, all of a sudden, you'll have providers that could bid against each other for placement in those uh, voice search results. And then all of a sudden you could have app platform revenue. That could be a real big win. Another run of Amazon at the Google model. Interesting stuff. Yes. Mark Mahaney, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Uh, Mark Mahaney, RBC Capital Market. Good to see you, Corey. All right. Well, coming up, some of the biggest banks in the U.S. are offering tech-like perks for their employees. How the financial industry is taking a page of the Silicon Valley's playbook next. This is Bloomberg. All right, from startups in Silicon Valley to heavyweights like Facebook and Google, tech companies have prioritized perks for employees. From unlimited vacations to free workout classes, they're trying to get the best talent. They're willing to give that up to get it. But the financial industry is now trying to play catch up. Laura Keller covers the big banks for Bloomberg News and joins us in New York with more. Laura, um, I, I love this story. I love this story. It's kind of like an aspirational story. It's like Vogue magazine or something. It's like, wait, who's got it better than me? Uh, <laughs> what is B of A doing for their employees right here? Right, Corey. So what B of A has decided to do is really introduce this pilot program into the investment bank. So any trader, any investment banker who wants to take this is allowed to. 
provided, of course, that they have been there 10 years and they're allowed to take between a four and a six week sabbatical depending on the number of years that they've been there. Um, it's intriguing too, because uh, B of A is not known for its, uh, at least in my experience, known for its sort of uh, uh, benevolence to its employees or creativity uh, when it comes to the, the, uh, the products that they offer or the way they take care of their people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're sort of commenting on what anyone who works at Bank of America really knows. And, you know, they're kind of viewed as, as certainly one of the more stodgy banks, you know, big Wall Street firm. And, you know, I think the CEO, Brian Moynihan, views the firm as changing, becoming more technological. He likes to describe the company as a technology company. But some of the perks that, you know, would go along with being a technology firm or really sort of the advancements on, you know, whether you're on the trading floor or really at large within the bank's branches, I mean, that's just not really there. Yeah, I wonder where this goes to. What are the perks that make, I mean, you know, you're in New York. What are the, what are the things that New Yorkers look at Silicon Valley companies? Is, is, it, is it the foosball machines, the ping pong, pong tables, the unlimited time off? What are the things that really get, the, the, that really get people's craw? Yeah, I mean, you hear a lot of the younger hedge fund analysts talking about the unlimited vacation. I think that's one thing that you do see them really take up if their fund offers that as a perk. Um, but for bankers too, I mean, older you know ones as well. I mean, this taking a sabbatical, you know, it's a shorter sabbatical. It's not a six month kind of thing where you could go out and write a book if you so chose. But four to six weeks, you know, to be able to focus on something that they haven't really had time for, or just to kind of recharge those batteries after being, you know, worked to the bone like some of these investment bankers and traders are. I think that that is something that people do tend to salivate over. I mean, it certainly raises eyebrows within the banking community to say, here's a bank that's going to offer you this. So certainly those long sabbaticals, that long time off is something that people look forward to. But I don't think well, that's... I think that I was just going to say, I don't think that's to discount, though, any of those great perks that Google has in terms of doing your dry cleaning and, you know, all the, all the right. gaming tables. But I think, I think it's really cool, you know, Autodesk right across the street from us here at Bloomberg out in San Francisco, they offer the same kind of sabbatical thing, but increasingly they're competing with the banks for the same kind of technological and programming talent. Right, exactly. And I think the banks very much understand this. Um, although if you do talk, uh, Brian Moynihan actually talked to David Weston about this a little bit. And what he said to him was, look, this allows us to retain some of our people. So I don't think it's just about, you know, grabbing those technology talented people that the banks want, but it's also about keeping people once they're there. All right, Laura, great stuff. Thank you so much, Laura Keller from Bloomberg News. Coming up, Silicon Valley Titan, Tom Siebel joins us to talk about punctuated equilibrium. This is a big idea, and I think you're really gonna like this because it helps you maybe understand where we're gonna see innovation in the future. This is Bloomberg. I'm Nabila Ahmed and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Almost a year into his presidency, the border wall Donald Trump promoted on the campaign trail amounts to eight prototypes, each no more than 30 feet long, sitting in a desert outside San Diego. Congress has not approved funds to advance the project and Mexico hasn't contributed a peso. Supporters of Russian President Vladimir Putin convened today to formally nominate him for the presidency. That's after he announced he will seek re-election as an independent candidate. Putin has been in power for 18 years and is expected to easily win another six-year term. Meanwhile, Russia's top election officials have formally barred opposition leader Alexei Navalny from a presidential run. The Kremlin also hinted today at possible legal repercussions for Navalny over his calls for a boycott of the March presidential election. 
Benjamin Netanyahu's allies in the Israeli parliament are pushing through a bill that critics say could be used to silence investigators. That comes as a corruption probe into the Prime Minister's dealings is close to completion. The proposed legislation would forbid police from submitting written recommendations to the state prosecutor's office on whether to indict a suspect. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nabila Ahmed, this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30pm here in New York, 6.30 Wednesday morning in Hong Kong. I'm joined by Bloomberg's David Inglis with a look at the markets. David, good morning. Very good morning to you. So we're just uh, about getting underway here Wednesday morning in the Asia Pacific. Uh, uh, New Zealand's already up and running flat on that market. I mean, most stocks, though, are on the way up. When you look at futures at the moment, roughly speaking, we're probably looking at moderate gains here at the open. Of course, uh, the next market to open up here is Australia, and we're looking at futures on that market up 11.6 thousand. 26 on there we got spy 200 futures uh, when you look at other things of course we're following as well uh, the yield in australia there we got 2.71 percent uh, of course the big story that we'll be tracking at the open in australia and of course when japan opens up as well are you know what happens to a lot of these oil related counters following this pop uh, in oil prices at the moment i'm just looking at my most active west texas uh, contract at 59.80 um, a lot of that simply comes down to, you know, what's been happening, of course, in Libya, an explosion there in one of the pipelines. And obviously this bullish look uh, when it comes to the budget over in Saudi Arabia. So oil's very much in the mix, as well as a lot of these Apple-related suppliers here listed in the Asia-Pacific. Water gains, light volumes, of course, as we approach the open of major markets here in the Asia-Pacific. I'm David Inglis. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Technology. I'm Corey Johnson. It's been part of the fabric of Silicon Valley for quite a while. It's one of the titans of enterprise software. It's Siebel Systems, acquired by Oracle for $5 billion in 2006. I know I was there. At least I was there covering it. Tom Siebel, CEO of C3 IoT now, focused on software for digital transformation. Tom with us now. Good to see you. I don't know if I've seen you since we were kiteboarding in Necker Island a while back when you were getting after it um, uh, early last year. Um, but you guys have been doing uh, great things at, at C3IoT. What problem are you trying to solve there? Uh, we're, we are working with some of the world's largest corporations to apply elastic cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and take advantage of the Internet of Things to basically engage in what is being called digital transformation. And basically taking companies that, that aren't yet digital in all the ways that they can do their work and to get there. Yes, they're now using this new generation of information, this new step function of information technology that's come online in the 21st century to change everything about the way they manage their business processes, design products, deliver products, deliver services. It's really, this is a, like nothing we've seen before. Now, I love uh, your idea about how we kind of look at technology to see new things. You came with this, they were found this idea of punctuated equilibrium, a notion of sort of from geology. Which, which basically says, tell me if I'm paraphrasing right, that by the time you've seen it, it's too late. That the big changes in evolution happen even faster than we can record them. So in geology, if we see uh, a new plant species or a new kind of animal, the big change of the, this thing coming into existence has already happened. Uh, the suggestion is the same thing is happening in technology. I think so. I, I gave this some thought. So I'm, I'm attempting to explain what's going on where we're seeing an exponential growth in the adoption, growth rate in the adoption of these new technologies. Right. Again, elastic cloud computing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence. And then the other aspect of this that I couldn't quite explain, like, it's like you, I've been around this business for a few decades now, yeah. and as we, move, a lot. As, we, as we move from mainframe computing to mini computing to personal computing to the Internet, all of these decisions were made by the CIO. Right. And now these digital transformations are all being driven by the CEO. And I was trying to figure out what this was all about because it's massively disruptive. And so I took a page out of evolutionary biology. And if you look at you know, early additions to the origin of species, Darwin thought that you know, speciation of the planet was kind of a continuous function right. that took place 
like we think in the information technology business that Moore's Law is a continuous function, that everything just, you know, constantly, you know, doubles every price, 18 months, yeah. right? But, but that it was, wasn't until like this century that an evolutionary biologist by the name of Stephen Gold said it didn't happen this way. Speciation wasn't a continuous process because Darwin couldn't explain the gaps in the fossil record. Right. And so what, what Stephen Gold describes is this concept of punctuated equilibrium. And he said going back even the last 400 million years, which is a relatively short period of time in the history of the planet, we've had you know, six mass extinction events, the most recent being 65 million years ago when that meteor hit right, Yucatan right, right. and something like 85% of the species on Earth disappeared, including the dinosaurs. So then, then, then after you have this mass extinction event, you have a mass speciation, which in that case was good for us because the mammals filled the space that the dinosaurs right, right, right. had. Now, let's look at what's going on in the corporate world. Since 2000, 52% of the Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. They've merged, they've well, gone that, bankrupt. You, you they've sent disappeared. me over to that effect, and I went back and started checking this. I couldn't believe that just since 2000, 50% of the, uh, the, the Fortune 500 companies have gone away. But it, it's amazing. Some have gone away through, you know, Enrons and WorldComs because of fraud. Some have just had big, massive mergers that have taken them out or taken out failing businesses. Businesses like Compaq that seem to be at the top of their game, taken out probably right before they're about to get hit by an asteroid. Gone, or Hewlett Packard, or, yeah. or maybe IBM's next. Who knows? But then you have what, what what, what you talk about every day on the show and what you and I are living in Silicon Valley is this mass speciation that's going on with companies with this new, whatever we talk about here, this new DNA, the Airbnbs, right. the Ubers, the well, Amazon. What I always say about the iPhone, for example, they, when the new iPhone comes out and someone's going to say, ah, oh, it's not that different than the last one. Well, the big change was when there was no iPhone until there was an iPhone, when there was no mobile, when there's no cloud to when there is a cloud. Everything after that's kind of a, a, a step change, but that big change is the big one that matters. The, tele the telecommunications industry as we knew it when you and I grew up is, is gone. Sure. And it's been replaced by the, by the portable uh, computer and the, and, the, and the portable communication device. But I, it, it's, are there still companies out there that can reinvent themselves enough to, uh, to, com to survive this new digital age? Oh, I think if you look at what's going on, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's in the funniest of places like Caterpillar, like John Deere, Engie in Paris, and now in Rome, Department of Defense. Uh, these, are, you know, these are companies where you I have guess the Department of Defense doesn't have a choice. It has to evolve. But, but it can't go away. Massive, massive, uh, you know, and these are CEOs. So you used to wonder, why is the CEO at the table making these technology decisions? He or she was never there before. And I think the fear is that the, you either you know, you get on the train or you're going to be on the tracks. You're Maybe they're big enough thinkers that they can actually get out ahead of this stuff, not try to buy you know, used to be the, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Maybe someone will get fired for buying IBM now. Hey, if you're Walmart and you're looking at Amazon and coming down the tracks, you're in a world of hurt, okay? And if you're in the automotive industry and you look at Uber or Tesla and, you know, what's going on there, and you, you don't adopt, you don't change, you know, it's not going to end well. It sounds also like what you're talking about with, with AI or IoT, pardon all the buzzwords, but uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, you're really talking about process, not just buy the latest software, we'll figure it out for you. You know, it changes everything. I mean, the, the, I used to think that the Internet of Things was about the censoring of value chains. It isn't. Okay, Internet of Things is about the fact that everything is becoming a computer. It's a change in the form factor of computing devices. So eyeglasses, heart monitors, you know, smart meters, cars, thermostats, refrigerators, everything's a computer. And then you apply Metcalfe's law to that, where the power of the network is a function of, say, How many 50 nodes? Yeah. billion nodes squared. Hey, that's a pretty powerful network. Uh, it's all kinds of stuff we haven't even imagined yet. Tom Siebel, always good to see you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Tom CEO, Siebel is the CEO of C3 IoT. All right, well, Tesla's planning on a pickup truck right after it completes the Model Y. It's according to CEO Elon Musk. Yeah, he's out today tweeting that he's, quote, had the core design and engineering elements in my mind for almost five years. I'm dying to build it. Ever the promoter, Musk also says the next generation of autopilot is in testing, and the results are, quote, blowing me away. I couldn't see that tweet because he's blocked me on Twitter, but that's a different story. All right, and the five-day slump on Bitcoin back after $15,000 per coin. We're going to talk to Lloyd Blankfein and Mike Bloomberg on the world's biggest digital currency next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on Bloomberg Radio. You can listen to Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com. In the U.S. and Sirius XM, Station 119, this is Bloomberg.
I remember the big Bitcoin sell-off? Forget about it. Bitcoin's back. It's back in rally mode. Cyber currency. Uh, at one point trading above sixteen thousand dollars per coin today. Uh, at one point on Friday, the digital currency had fallen as much as thirty percent. During the U.S. trading day, it rallied over twenty percent. But the tumble uh, coincided with several warnings from financial authorities about elevated risk in holding digital coins. Now, earlier this year, Bloomberg's Alex Steele spoke with Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, and Mike Bloomberg, founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, to examine the merits of Bitcoin and the future of cryptocurrency. For small businesses and businesses in general, when do they have to have a Bitcoin strategy? Mike? Not in our lifetime. For real? Really? I. Bitcoin is not, forget about whether you think it's a fraud, whether you think it's a game and tulip bulbs or not. The small businesses have to worry about how they're going to attract five people to produce a product, how they're going to figure out how to sell it and keep the door open and clean up at the end of the day. Small businesses are where the rubber meets the road. They're not dealing in extensive financial transactions. They're dealing in trying to create products that people want to buy. And it's one person selling to one person much more so than all the things we talk about. So let's broaden that out, Lloyd. You have not rejected or endorsed Bitcoin, no. okay? But when does Goldman have to have a Bitcoin strategy? Have to have it? Yeah. I, 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 not today. I mean, I, I, I said when. I'd say life must be really, really rosy if this is what we're talking about. It just feels... This is what Wall Street's talking... Okay, so I, I, was talking I, I, to, I, I was talking to Jeff Curry over, over at Goldman the other day, yeah. and he said the only thing that people are asking him are Bitcoin and EVs. So you're well, a huge saying, investment life, bank. Life, you have life to be must be really rosy this. if this is... Yes, I'm thinking about it because I get asked about it. I said, uh, look, where I am is it's not for me, but there's a lot of things that weren't for me in the past that worked out very well. If you told me that if it was 20 years forward and it worked out, I could tell you why it worked out. But based on everything I know, uh, I know I'm not guessing that it will work out. But I can't say, I'm not going to stand there and be stride and say it's a fraud, it can't, because a, it might. Alex, I think also people confuse Bitcoin with BitChain. There or is a technology, yeah. blockchain, there is a technology where you can have different accesses to data, different people can control it, you can see who's doing what and that sort of thing. And there are places where that is a useful thing. In fact, the Bloomberg system is a, a blockchain. We just, instead of having the users control it, we control it, but it has all the attributes of that. Bitcoin is something very different. Bitcoin, and there's a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies mm. that have been started every, other, every day, you just have a new one. That's something very different, and whether or not the, the governments of the world will lose control of monetary policy, I'm skeptical. They're just not going to let and that happen, that and moves, they shouldn't. Something that moves up and down 20% in a day doesn't feel like a current, doesn't feel like a store. And it's just being quoted up and down. I don't think it's yeah. volume. Maybe it's not, not a trading, currency, yeah. but Jeff Curry told me it was a commodity, and that goes to your expertise, Lloyd. You grew up in the commodity business. So talk to me about what are the unregulated trading world of Bitcoin? Like, where's the fraud going to come? The whole concept is, uh, I, I don't, well, first of all, But is it buyer, is it seller, use, is it price discovery? Like, wh where's the risk there look, in the one financial of the, One of the main uses of Bitcoin is as a vehicle for perpetrating fraud. I mean, because you can't trace it. There's no payment. Uh, so is cash sometimes? So is cash, but guess what? It's hard to accumulate cash sometimes. Yeah, but the world is going in a different direction, if you think about it. Go look in China, where they're basically getting rid of cash. Everybody is paying with their smartphones. People who are begging in the streets have a little sign next to where they're sitting in the streets. These are people who really need help from society. Instead, they're sitting there begging for money. They have a sign with a code on it, a QR code. If you want to give them money, really? you point your cell phone at the QR code, hit a button, and they have a bank account. And that's the way they're getting their money. China is heading in the direction, and they've gone a very large way, as is India starting to do the same thing, of getting rid of cash. And one of the reasons is that you can then stop the black market and stop the drug dealers, and you can track where all the currency is going. We're not going to go in a different direction. Now, America may not be ready to go there, although we're going to be left behind if we don't, because this is a much more efficient ways of pay paying for goods and services. So, Lloyd, that's they're what... also going to know what everybody's doing with their money. Of course they're going to yes. know, but Google already knows exactly what <laughs> yeah. you're doing. And Amazon, and nobody by the way. Complains How much am I buying? Nobody complains about but, that. But, Lloyd, so that raises the question. You have to be thinking about an investment banking strategy with Bitcoin. I can't no, believe that you're not. No, I don't have to be thinking right. about that. You want to tell me that you're not you talking about any your guys. What? You're not talking to your no, guys. I what hear the it and I do it, be. but we're spending too. It's just you know we'll see. 
if it works out and it gets more established and it trades like a uh, like a store of value and it doesn't move up and down 20 percent and there's liquidity in it you know we'll get to it but you asked me the, the, the original question was when do small business people have to think about their bitcoin strategy i'd worry about opening the doors producing things that people want to buy well, dealing with their you know business so planning and that was Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, and Mike Bloomberg, the founder majority owner of Bloomberg LP. Alex Seal, of course, of Bloomberg News. Right, well, over 2017, Square, one of the big winners in mobile payment sales, up 41%. The stock was up 150%. We're going to bring in the highlights from our conversation with Square's part time CEO, Jack Dorsey. This is Bloomberg. Well, Square, the payment company led by Twitter co-founder Jack Dorsey, has seen its shares nearly double this year, 150% for the year, outperforming most other companies. Well, this all because of investor optimism, and it's all-in-one offerings for merchants. Our Emily Chang sat down with Square's chairman and CEO, Jack Dorsey, he's part-time CEO, still at, at Twitter as well. But looking at the second quarter earnings back in August, right afterwards, Emily asked him what he thinks of sky-high tech valuations. Check it out. Well, I'm not a economist so I, I don't know how to answer that question I mean I, I think you know we, we live in a market and uh, the markets decided to value it at this particular thing and um, that will always have ebb and flows and uh, it's not something we control what we control is do people want to use what we're building and uh, our job is to make sure that that answer is yes and they want to use it so much that they can't help but talk about it with people that ask for recommendations about what tools should I use. I'm just starting a business or I'm trying to get out of this nasty contract. Where should I go? Um, and, you know, that's that's the thing we control and that's the thing we focus on. So you must have a keen insight into the health of the U.S. and global consumer. Where do you see people spending and not spending and what's your confidence? You know, we see people going to our sellers and we see people um, uh, purchasing and, you know, those trends continue to be positive. And, you know, I think um, the great thing about Square's business is it's non-discretionary. Um, so everything else can fade away, but you have to be able to make the sale. Uh, I feel really good about what we're seeing in the economy and, and also how we will continue to thrive and support that. There have been a number of reports about sexual harassment in the tech industry. People have lost their jobs. It's renewed concern about the lack of women in tech. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, it's something we is in a, a situation that we absolutely have to um, provide a lot more attention to. And our, our focus has really always been on inclusion first um, and making sure that we're building an organization, an environment, um, and a company that people feel like they belong um, and people feel like they can contribute to um, and they feel a part of. And um, you can say that, but we, we also need to make sure that it's not just an environment that people um, belong, but they can actually help contribute to decision making and, uh, and to really um, make sure that um, they continue to help, they, they help own our outcome. The gap between Silicon Valley and President Trump still seems quite large. <laughs> what role do tech companies play and leaders like you, Jack Dorsey, in closing that gap? I don't think there's any difference in the role tech companies play or individuals like me play. You know, I think the most important thing is to have an open conversation and to really speak up. And if we can't speak up and if if we can't be open and transparent about how we feel about policy shifts, we're going to move backwards as a as a country and as as a world. Um, so uh, that's my role. That's our company's role. That's our industry's role. But it's every citizen in this country's role as well. I'm certainly going to use my role and um, my experience to uh, uh, to inform what I what I believe is right and and what I believe is is necessary. As somebody who runs a company that moves a lot of money around, how concerned are you about not just economic but <coughs> political uncertainty right now? Well, I mean, every entrepreneur and leader has to deal with uncertainty, um, and we just have to be comfortable with that. Um, and uh, the economic uncertainty that uh, you know people talk about is is not something I necessarily feel on a daily basis to affect my decision making. Um, 
what I am concerned with is the economic disparity that we're seeing not just in this country but around the world. Um, and our goal as a company, um, and we'll have a very small part, but it's a part nonetheless, is to continue to provide tools for people to uh, engage in the economy and participate in the economy. And, um, and we're going to do our best uh, to do that. So that's what we're focused on trying to help fix. We're not going to do it alone, um, but we're going to have a loud voice as we do. So last question, how does that impact where Square goes next? You've been expanding abroad. Where to next? Well, we want to go everywhere. We want to be a, a tool and a service that's used, that's accessible to everyone in the world. Um, we have a lot more friction in our industry um, because we have to work with banking partners and we have to work with regulators. And uh, you know, every local uh, market has its own rules and regulations. So we're going to take our time because we want to do it right. We we don't need to be first in market. Um, we just need to be the best option out there. Interesting guy. Square's part-time CEO, Jack Dorsey, speaking with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder that we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out, at Technology is a handle. Weekdays at 5 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.